In the beginning, Eru, the One, who in the elvish tongue is named Iluvata, made the Ainur of his thought, and they made a great music before him. In this music, the world was begun. For Ilovata made visible the song of the Ainur, and they beheld it as a light in the darkness. And many among them became enamored of its beauty and of its history, which they saw beginning and unfolding as in a vision. Therefore, Ilovata gave to their vision being, and set it amid the void, and the secret fire was sent to burn at the heart of the world, and it was called Ea. Then those of the Ainur who desired it arose and entered into the world at the beginning of time, and it was their task to achieve it, and by their labors to fulfill the vision which they had seen. Long they labored in the regions of Ea, which are vast beyond the thought of elves and men, until in the time appointed was made Arda, the kingdom of earth. Then they put on the raiment of earth, and descended into it, and dwelt therein. There was Eru, the One, who in Ardur is called Iluvatar. And he made first the Ainur, the Holy Ones, that were the offspring of his thought. And they were with him before aught else was made. And he spoke to them, propounding to them themes of music. And they sang before him, and he was glad. But for a long while they sang only each alone, or but few together, while the rest hearkened. For each comprehended only that part of the mind of Philovetta from which he came. And in the understanding of their brethren, they grew but slowly. Yet ever as they listened, they came to deeper understanding and increased in unison and harmony. And it came to pass that Ilovatar called together all the Ainur and declared to them a mighty theme, unfolding to them things greater and more wonderful than he had yet revealed. And the glory of its beginning and the splendor of its end amazed the Ainur, so that they bowed before Ilovatar and were silent. Then Ilovatar said to them, of the theme that I have declared to you, I will now that ye make in harmony together a great music. And since I have kindled you with the flame imperishable, ye shall show forth your powers in adorning this theme, each with his own thoughts and devices, if you will. But I will sit with Arthur, and be glad that through you great beauty has been awakened into song. Then the voices of the Ainur, like unto harps and lutes and pipes and trumpets and viols and organs, and like unto countless choirs singing with words, began to fashion the theme of Ilovata to a great music. And the sound arose of endless interchanging melodies woven in harmony that passed beyond here into the depths and into the heights and the places of the dwelling of Ilovata were filled to overflow, and the music and the echo of the music went out into the void, and it was not. Never since have the Ainur made any music like this music, though it has been said that a greater still shall be made before Ilovata by the choirs of the Ainur and the children of Ilovata after the end of days. Then the themes of Ilovata shall be played aright and take being in the moment of their utterance, for all shall then understand fully his intent in their part, and each shall know the comprehension of each. And Ilovata shall give to their thoughts the secret fire, being well pleased. But now Ilovata sat and hearkened, and for a great while it seemed good to him, for in the music there were no flaws. But as the theme progressed, it came into the heart of Melkor to interweave matters of his own imagining that were not in accord with the theme of Ilovata. For he sought therein to increase the power and glory of the part assigned to himself. 
to Melkor, among the Ainur had been given the greatest gifts of power and knowledge, and he had a share in all the gifts of his brethren. He had gone often alone to the void places seeking the imperishable flame, for desire grew hot within him to bring into being things of his own, and it seemed to him that Iluvatar took no thought for the void, and he was impatient of its emptiness. Yet he found not the fire, for it is with Iluvatar. But being alone, he had begun to conceive thoughts of his own unlike those of his brethren. Some of these thoughts he now wove into his music, and straightway discord arose about him, and many that sang nigh him grew despondent, and their thought was disturbed and their music faltered. But some began to attune their music to his rather than to the thought which they had at first. Then the discord of Melkor spread ever wider, and the melodies which had been heard before foundered in a sea of turbulent sound. But Ilovata sat and harped until it seemed that about his throne there was a raging storm, as of dark waters that made war one upon another, and an endless wrath that would not be swayed. Then Ilovata arose, and the Ainur perceived that he smiled. He lifted up his left hand, and a new thing began to make the storm. Like, and yet unlike the former thing, and it gathered power, and had new beauty. But the discord of Melkor rose in uproar, and contended with it. And again, there was a war of sound, more violent than before, until many of the Ainur were dismayed, and sang no longer. And Melkor mastered. Then again, Ilvata arose, and the Ainur perceived that his countenance was stern, and he lifted up his right hand, and behold, a third theme grew in the confusion, and it was unlike the others. For it seemed at first soft and sweet, a mere rippling of gentle sounds in delicate melodies, as it could not be quenched, and it took to itself power and profundity. And it seemed at last that there were two musics progressing at one time before the seat of the battle, and they were utterly hilarious. The one was deep and wide and beautiful, but slow, and blended with an immeasurable sorrow, from which its beauty chiefly came. The other had now achieved a unity of its own, but it was loud and vain and endlessly repeated, and it had little harmony but rather a clamorous unison as of many trumpets brayed upon a few notes. And it essayed to drown the other music by the violence of its voice, but it seemed that its most triumphant notes were taken by the other and woven into its own solemn pattern. In the midst of this strife, whereat the halls of Uluvata shook and a tremor ran out into the silences yet unmoved, Ilovata arose a third time, and his face was terrible to behold. Then he raised up both his hands, and in one chord, deeper than the abyss, higher than the firmament, piercing as the light of the eye of Ilovata, the music ceased. Then Ilovata spoke, and he said, Mighty are the Ainur, and mightiest among them is Melkor, but that he may know, and all the Ainur, that I am Ilovata, those things that ye have sung, I will show them forth, that ye may see what ye have done. And thou, Melkor, shalt see that no theme may be played that hath not its uttermost source in me, nor can any alter the music in my despite. For he that attempteth this, shall prove but mine instrument in the devising of things more wonderful, which he himself has not imagined. Then the Ainur were afraid, and they did not yet comprehend the words that were said to them. And Melkor was filled with shame, of which came secret anger. And Ilovata arose in splendor, and he went forth from the fair regions that he had made 
followed. But when they were come into the void, Gilobata said to them, Behold your music. And he showed to them a vision, giving to them sight where before was only hairy. And they saw a new world made visible before them. And it was globed amid the void, and it was sustained therein, but was not of it. And as they looked and wondered, this world began to unfold its history. And it seemed to them that it lived and grew. And when the Ainur had gazed for a while and was silent, Ilovata said again, Behold your music. This is your minstrelsy, and each of you shall find contained herein, amid the design that I set before you, all those things which it may seem that he himself devised or added. And thou, Melkor, wilt discover all the secret thoughts of thy mind, and wilt perceive that they are but a part of the whole, and tributary to its glory. And many other things the battle spoke to the Ainur at that time. And because of their memory of his words and the knowledge that each has of the music that he himself made, the Ainur know much of what was, and is, and is to come. And few things are unseen by them. Yet some things there are that they cannot see, neither alone nor taking counsel together. For to none but himself as Ilovata revealed all that he has in store. And in every age, there come forth things that are new and have no foretelling, for they do not proceed from the past. And so it was, that as this vision of the world was played before them, the Ainur saw that it contained things which they had not known. And they saw with amazement the coming of the children and the habitation that was prepared for them. And they perceived that they themselves and the labor of their music had been busy with the preparation of this dwelling, and yet knew not that it had any purpose beyond its own beauty. For the children of Hilabata were conceived by him alone. And they came with the third theme, and were not in the theme which Hilabata propounded at the beginning, and none of the Ainur had part in their making. Therefore, when they beheld them, the more did they love them, being things other than themselves, strange and free, wherein they saw the mind of Ilavata reflected anew, and learned yet a little more of his wisdom, which otherwise had been hidden even from the eye. Now the children of Ilavata are elves and men, the firstborn and the father. And amid all the splendors of the world, its vast halls and spaces and its wheeling fires, Ilovata chose a place for their habitation in the deeps of time, and in the midst of the innumerable stars. And this habitation might seem a little thing to those who consider only the majesty of the idol, not their terrible sharpness, as who should take the whole field of ardor for the foundation of the pillar and so raise it until the cone of its summit were more bitter than a needle. Or who consider only the immeasurable vastness of the world, which still the Ainur are shaping, and not the minute precision to which they shape all things therein. But when the Ainur had beheld this habitation in the vision, and had seen the children of Ilavata arise there, then many of the most mighty among them bent all their thought and their desire towards that place. And of these, Melkor was the chief, even as he was in the beginning the greatest of the island who took part in the music. And he failed, even to himself at first, that he desired to go there and order all things for the good of the children of the battle, controlling the turmoils of the heat and the cold that had come to pass through him. But he desired rather to subdue to his will both elves and men, envying the gifts with which Ilovata promised to endow them. And he wished himself to have subjects and servants, and to be called 